Okay, so today's topic is on interpretable machine learning. So first definitely is what is interpretable machine learning, right? And uh, I think to really understand that we need to distinguish it from explainable machine learning. So to me, interpretable machine learning is like a glass box machine learning. So you basically you have, you're going to build a model that is not a uh, black box. So it's a glass glass box. We call it a glass box uh, approaches. So some examples of this interpretable machine learning is the linear models, right? It's just as simple as a linear regression. Right? So it's very easy to understand. Uh, and uh, also decision trees. Uh, and then in, in this uh, talk, I'm also going to talk to you about the rule list model and even one more advanced model called explainable boosting machine. So these are all glass box approaches, which is the interpretable uh, machine learning. And people also uh, talk often about explainable machine learning. Well, explainable machine learning is, is uh, you can think of it as a black box explainer. So in this scenario is you train, you have trained a black box model, which is, which can be very complicated, right? Just like uh, not explainable boosting machine, but just as usual, XGBoost or some other boosting, boosting trees. That is not that easy to, to, be, uh, to be interpreted themselves. Uh, and also deep learning, right? So people usually think of it as a, as a black box. So this explainable ML is going to, uh, it's, it's a post-processing step. So it's going to explain this model afterwards, right? So you, you, you have a black box already there, already trained, and you want to look into the black box and to see what the black box is actually doing, what we're trying to approximate, approximate that. And again, there are, there, there are many algorithms. Uh, they, they are also model agnostic. Uh, algorithm means that this type of analysis can be applied to any black box model, uh, such as nine shap and also some other uh, sensitivity analysis and the partial dependence analysis. So in today's uh, talk, I will mainly focus on the first one. So mainly focus on the glass box ML or interpretable ML. Uh, and maybe in the next one, I will talk about a explainable ML. So to see how, if you have a black box model, then how can we, how can we look into that black, black box model? Uh, so usually people may think of in the machine learning space, uh, there's a trade-off between the accuracy and interpretability. So here is like the intelligibility. You can think of the, this one is the, the same equivalent to interpretability, right? So people may think of, for example, the linear regression, it may have relatively lower accuracy, the model accuracy or prediction power, but it's very easy to, to be interpreted. Well, on the other side is all those uh, boosting trees, random forest, those boosting and bagging uh, models, and also the deep learning neural network models. They are kind of on the left higher end side. So they really gives you very powerful predictions, right? So they can get you very high accuracy. Uh, but at the same time, it's very hard to explain uh, because you don't know, you know, how each individual uh, uh, feature plays a role in the final predicted outcome, right? So people may usually think of, okay, there's a trade-off, right? You need, you always need to trade off uh, to, you know, between the accuracy and the interpretability. But is it true, right? Does we always have to do this trade-off? Uh, and actually, often it's not that true. And actually, in the machine learning com research uh, community, there has been a trend of people trying to uh, increase the accuracy for the interpretable models. So later on, what this chart will be look like will be look like this, right? People are trying to uh, invent the models, such as the ex explainable boosting machines. 
right? So they, while maintaining the interpretability levels of it, they also want to have very good accuracy performance, um, such as the explainable boosting machines that I'm going to introduce next. Uh, and also uh, the decision trees. So people are also uh, evolved the decision tree, maybe converted to uh, some like rule list based models so that we have shorter, shorter rules because decision trees, you can get really, really long paths to the leaf nodes. Sometimes it's, it's, it's not that direct and straightforward, right? So people then trying to figure out how to shorten the rules uh and and maybe you can have the most impactful short rules uh to help you make that decision so uh the scope rules is one of models that is <clears throat> that aims to do that so then in today's meetup we are going to focus on the first is the scope rules so it's a rule list based models and also the second type is the exp explainable uh boosting machines So, uh, <clears throat> so during the meetup, feel free to interrupt me, or, or, or if you have a question, feel free to uh, throw your questions in the chat. Since this is uh, interactive, I hope it is like a conversation, like a, like a meetup. So first, uh, let's go to uh, from decision tree to rule list. Right, so this is sometimes what a decision tree can look like, right? So you have a root node, and then at each at each node, you are going to make a decision like which feature to use and at what point to split the data set. So and then you are going to grow the tree until say the maximum depth is reached or the leaf has this minimum number of samples in the leaf node. So this is what the decision tree looks like. And at the first glance, of course, you can see all the rules at each node, right? But it can grow really, really be deep. And then at that time, it's not that interpretable anymore. And people may feel like, well, it's too long to, you know, to figure out all the rules and, and, and to figure out why it makes that decision at the leaf node. <clears throat> and then people kind of move uh, on to the rule list because we still love rules, but we want shorter shorter rules, right? So, so people propose a question like, can we have a set of rules that can be uh, expressive, as expressive as decision trees, but at the same time be more compact? And also uh, more compact means shorter rules. So basically we have a shorter path till we make a decision. Uh, and also we want to minimize the duplicates, right? For example, uh, on the decision tree, these two need nodes, Actually, all they, they, they share a lot in common, right? So these two rules, they only differ in the last in the last three three points. And all the previous three, three points are exactly the same. So they have these two rules has has almost uh, ninety percent uh, overlap, right? And in the rule list based models, we don't want that. We want the duplicate uh, rules as smaller as possible. So that's that's the main difference between the decision tree and, and the rule list a rule list model. Uh, so one type of rule list model I want to introduce here is called a scope rules. So scope you can think of scope is like a scoping a target class. So it tries to identify the uh, rules that can detecting this class with high precision, right? For example, uh, the so this is an example of the output uh, for, 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 for this model, right? So for example, the goal is to, to predict the risk of the long default. Uh, and here it, it will generate two rules. So actually it's very simple to read, right? So because it just has, for example, three or two rules in it, uh, and then the first is, uh, for example, the debit flow is smaller than this, and then credit flow, and whether that client is gold or not. And then this is the second rule. And along each rule is going to have several uh, kind of the evaluation metric. For example, for this just this one single rule, what is the pre precision of the rule? What is the recall of it? 
and how many times this rule appears in the trees. So this is kind of like the to, to quantify the quality of the rules. And if we are, so this is an example of the output uh, of these scope rules. And also if we uh, plot it or compare it against other uh, like uh, highly accurate models such as the, the normal gradient boosting, the random forest, and also decision trees, right? So we can compare it on this graph with the x-axis being the record, which is the true positive rate, and the y-axis is the precision. It's like how uh, out of this 10 samples, you predict how many, what's a percentage uh, of those 10 samples that are, are accurate. And when you plot this, you can find that actually it's a, the, 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 this scope rules provides almost the same, like the, the frontiers, right? The accuracy frontiers with the random forest, which is not that straightforward to explain, right? So you, because you have so many trees in, in, in one model and then you, 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 you cannot like as straightforward as this one that you directly see what are the rules to make you, to help you make that uh, decision. So when you plot this, you can find that uh, if you just use the first rule, this is where it lies on this. So it's pretty much on the free front here. And, and also you can combine several rules, right? So for example, if I want to combine the first rule and the second rule together, and again, this is their performance uh, of, of the procedure and the record after that. And okay, again, you can compile the third rules and the fourth rules, and then you are see there, you are, you are going to get a kind of like a frontiers. Uh, over here, and so see that okay. Actually, for this type of uh, for this prediction task, uh, scope rules have very similar performance to uh, random forest, which is pretty cool. Um, okay, so uh, any questions so far before I move into the details of scope rules? Okay, and then let's move on to what, so how it's going to generate those uh, simple but effective rules. Right? So actually in the beginning, it's still like a random forest to me because it's a bagging estimator. So it, it will still generate lots of decision trees. Uh, and actually this model is originally proposed just to predict the binary classification problem. So the, so the X can be any features, right? Numerical, categorical, or encoded categorical features. And the Y is uh, zero or one um, target variables. And in the bag estimator, you are going to train many uh, shallow decision trees, right? And, and, and those trees are, are trained based on some uh, samples of your training data. So each tree will be look a little bit different from other trees, right? So it's kind of like the same process in, in the bagging uh, in the bagging model. And then from this set of decision trees, you are going to extract the logic rules from those because each need node kind of corresponds to a, to a rule uh, there, right? And then for each single rule, you are going to calculate the precision and the recall. Say just if I just going to use that one single rule, so what is the accuracy performance looks like? Uh, and then once you calculate your precision and recall, you can do some filtering and also add score. And then you can do some filtering of those rules and then that will lead you to some very high performing rules. Like for example, I want my precision to be at least 80%, 0.8, and my recall to be at least, uh, for example, 0.1, because uh, in, in this scenario, I just want a highly uh, precise uh, uh, rules. Uh, and then it will uh, after this filtering, you will get some high performing uh, rules. And then the next is we want to deduplicate since uh, some rules can have you know lots lots in common, right? So some rules can you know have very uh, large similarities. So we want just to pick one of those instead of using uh, all of them, right? So we we want to do some deduplicate process so that. Not they are not only high performing, but at the same time they are also heterogeneous rules. So the the rules that should be quite distinct from each other. 
So how can we do this deduplication process? And in their methods, they propose this semantic deduplication. So the first is they they just uh, first um, uh, they they so here is the, the the step right. So here is the step say from the last step that you need to filter all your rules by, for example, by F1 score. So this rule. Let me turn off my video. So what is the last of, what is the last uh one uh, do you do you hear? Yes, I can hear you. We we can hear you now, but yeah, that that no 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 the that slide yes this one right no no this, this one yes, this one yeah. okay so so have uh, you hear about the high performing rules that's where you were cut off i think yeah okay okay got it uh, okay uh so so here say once we have these high performing rules say according to the threshold we set right and then we need to do some uh, another process called the deduplication process. So the deduplication is to figure out, so like three, three rules, right? Say we have three rules, three high performing rules, but this rules has a lot of similarity. Uh, and instead of using all three of them, we may just want to use one of them, right? So this is a process that we want to remove some redundancy uh, in the rules. So the outcome of this deduplication process is we want to have not only high performing rules, but also heterogeneous rules, that the rules are quite distinct uh, from each other. Okay, so, so how can we do the de deduplication? Uh, and in their, in their method, they, uh, they call it the semantic one. So say here is a uh, filter the rules ordered by the F1 score, right? So this is the most effective rule, and this is the second most effective one as such. And then the first is you want to figure out, okay, what is the most commonly variable that got used in the rule? And from this set, you say, okay, the, the, the C0 seems to be the most frequent one. And then you start with C0. And then you want to start into three branch, uh, say which is the C0 is smaller than some value in the rule, or C0 is larger than, or C0 doesn't exist in the rule, right? And then you basically break this rule set into three sets. And then in, in the next round, you are going to again figure out, okay, what is the next variable in, the, in those set? And here the case is the variable C1 and C1 and variable C2. Uh, and then you are going to basically put the, these rules into each of these three, three branch. Right? For example, this rule here means that, okay, C0 is smaller than three. So it goes through this, this path since we have this um, kind of this uh, criteria over here, right? So C0 is smaller than X in the rule. And then we go to C1. So here is the C1 is in the rule. So this, this rule goes to this leaf. And we have a maximum depth uh, duplications equals to, so we will just grow the this kind of branches two times, right? And then we each rule is going to fall into this branch branch. Uh, and the deduplication process is well, for example, over here at this need node, you have actually two rules over here, and then you are just keeping the first most effective one. Right. And then the second branch here has only one rule. Yeah, that's it. We are going to keep it. Uh, but here again, on this branch, you, you again have two rules, which both has like C0, C0 is smaller than some something. Uh, and then we are going to remove this one uh, along this branch uh, as such. Right? So whenever you find there's a duplication in, in this uh, semantic uh, branch, we are going just to keep the top first uh, the top first one uh, in, in, in that. So that's how they do the deduplications to make sure that the, the rules that looks quite different from each other 
in, in your final candidate sets. Okay, so I think I will pause a little bit here. So is there any question? Okay, if not, then we can see some examples. Uh, so here, for example, we want to uh, detect the inliers from the outliers. So we have just this two dimensional um, data. Right. And, and then the white is the inliers and the, uh, the white is inliers and the red is the outliers. Uh, and we are going to train this uh, scope rule uh, models. Uh, and then actually from that, they also provide a function called decision function. So this is basically tell you, okay, what area kind of uh, are most often picked or, or most often covered by the rules. For example, the dark blue area. So this area is, shows up a lot uh, in, in, in many rules, right? And, and the lighter ones means maybe this region is only covered by one rule or two rules. And this dark blue regions are covered by many rules. So it's kind of showing the, the confidence level of, of how, how likely that these are true outliers. So we can call the decision function to see what this model is doing. Uh, like overrolling. Uh, and what is more interesting is you can also plot, say, prediction with just with the with just the top rules. Right? For example, if we just set the top rules to be one, and this is what the region looks like. So it's just a very so this is the rule for the top top one rule. So it's uh, C0 has a range and C1 is smaller than some value. So you got this region. Uh, and this is just one rule, right? And it seems it's already very effective. And then say we want to predict with top two rules. And this is the second most effective rules over here. And then this already covers a pretty much a very good regions um, to it. And then if we set the top n rules to be three, so this is the third more effective one. So if we look at a uh, closer look at it, you'll find that the third most effective one is almost the uh, same with the first one, right? So it actually doesn't add much additional information uh, to the rule set. So that's why you see that the third and fourth one, actually this region doesn't change much over there. And for this problem is already good enough if you just use the top two rules. Yeah, so I think it's very straightforward. And also the rule is very easy to read since it's very short. And also we want to make sure that the, the, the final results, the, the, the set of rules are, uh, are diversified, right? So the second rule is quite distinct from the first rule. Yeah, and the third and fourth rule is kind of the overlap with the top two. So we, we may just remove them. So this problem is just solved with the top two rules. Yeah, so I find this, uh, this type of models very useful, especially you want just to you know, uh, have a very quick decision and, and have very direct insight into, into how the model is going to give you a number, right? So you can get a very quick, fast uh, output just ba based on this lo logic, logic comparisons. Yeah. Okay, uh, any questions so far on the scope rules? I have a question. Uh, uh -huh. Data is uh, from real data or it's it is synthetic? Yeah, this data is synthetic. Just to show what this is doing, just to show different rules. Yeah, it's, it's, it's synthetic data, this one. Uh, okay. But the okay. first one, this one is the real data. So it's, it's, it's to predict uh, known default. So this one is, uh, is, a, is a real data set that they, they just tells you what is the top uh, effective rules that can, you know, can, can already kind of pretty much solve the problem to some extent. And they claim that they have equivalent performance to random forest uh, on this problem. Oh, I see, thank you.
Okay. Uh, so so next time uh, when you want uh when you feed the decision tree and you feel well the decision tree is is so deep you know to 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 uh figure out all the rules to or, or so long to reach the decision maybe you want to try some of these rule list based models uh to see whether they can give you a more uh abbreviate uh, you know more direct uh, straightforward uh, rules for you to to make that to reach that decision point Okay, so next, I think we are moving on to a more powerful interpretable model. Uh, it's an explainable boosting machine. So, so in order to introduce that, I want just to briefly uh, recap on what is a boosting machine. So, uh, so a, a boosting machine, first you need to choose a single estimator. Okay, so people usually choose a tree, like a decision tree as a single uh, estimator. And then uh, originally or normally uh, for the normal boosting machine, they usually, uh, each tree can actually utilize any feature. So say you have 10 features, then each, each tree is trained on those 10 features. And then you train the trees iteratively. That means first you just train one tree, right? So for example, on this synthetic data set, so you have kind of like the five groups, the Y over here. So in the first tree, you just train one tree. So it gives you uh, just the one speed point, for example, over here. And then you calculate the residuals uh, of the actuals versus the predicted value, right? So here you plot the residuals from the first fitted tree. And then the next time you are going to feed a tree to the residuals, right? And, and to further reduce the residuals from the model. So this is a kind of the uh the the predictions uh, tree on, on, on the third iteration and again you find that this is a residual left uh from your data and say you, you later on you train this iteratively and until you reach the iteration 19. and then you find that oh the tree can capture this variation already very well and then you find that the residuals are kind of no obvious pattern in there and it's all close to zero and that indicates the end of this iterative process. So the boosting machine is this, right? So you train the trees iteratively and each tree is going to, or aims to reduce the residuals from last tree. And after it's finished, actually you get uh, 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 just one function, right? So you just get one function with all the features at the input and then it's going to give you an output. And this function is basically a weighted sum of all the, and of all the trees over there, right? Well, one drawback of this then is uh, later on you, it's not that you're uh, straightforward to interpret it, right? To, it's not straightforward to say, okay, out of this a uh, predicted value, like why are you giving me that value? So this model uh, does not directly provide a way to give you that explanation. And then people are thinking about, okay, can I make the model able to explain themselves? And then they refer back to the generalized attitude model because people are used to using uh, linear models for the explanation because it's just very simple and straightforward, right? So you, you have this additive effect of each feature of there, right? So the, the, you know, say if you have this kind of linear model, you know that, okay, X1, it gives me this much contribution to the final predicted outcome. Uh, and to make the linear model more generalized, actually we can turn this linear term into a function term. Uh, and, and, and all of this will becomes a function of, the, of that uh, individual variable, say the beta one multiplied by x one, which is the linear term, we can convert it into a functional term of f one of x one plus f two plus t o f n, which is the n feature. So this is your additive model, uh, and and you, you see that actually we move on from a linear one to a more complicated functional form f. And but what we reserving is we still reserve it as an additive model so that we still can directly extract what is the effects, what is the contribution of that of that feature, 
right? So we so if we want the effect from x one, I can just use f one x one. That directly gives 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 me the effect uh, or the contribution of x one. Uh, similarly, we can also extend the additive model to the interaction, uh, pairwise interaction or thirdwise uh, interactions, and you can learn a function of that. And for the for the pre previous example, that is the original GBM models, is basically it doesn't have this additive, it doesn't have this additive uh, separation. So it's basically just one function over all the all the features there right? and then it lose kind of this interpretability of this additive effects uh, so the general additive model originally is developed at stanford uh, again it, it has lots of other uh, assumptions then it can be conservative and people right now make it want to make it uh, a more data driven that the f f so we want to remove the assumptions of f like what form the f can take but we want to use, for example, use a tree to approximate uh, the F form. So, so people uh, then develop the explainable uh, boosting machine uh, to, to, to use the trees to, to approximate each F over here. Uh, and actually people have released, and this is a research from Microsoft, uh, and it, they, they call that library as the interpret ML, uh, and this explainable boosting machine is, uh, is, uh, is one of the most successful release in that interpret ML library. Okay, so uh, next I think I want to walk through uh, how, so how EBM is trained, right? Uh, so, so uh, like uh, in the in, uh, in original setting of the boosting machine, you just at each iteration you just train one tree, right? And then in the next generation you do train another tree. So at each iteration you only have one tree. But for the expl explainable boosting machine, you actually are going to train a tree for each feature. So if you have n feature, you're going to have n tree at iteration one, uh, and then the idea is the same, right? So you, you still just train a tree and the next tree is going to focus on uh, reducing the residual from the last tree, but the tree is all separated. We want to keep it separate so that later on we can directly extract the effect uh, or extract the contribution of this feature one or feature two. So in the next round, uh, iteration two, again, all the trees are separate. So each feature, has its own tree over here, right? And then we can run this many, many iterations. And the, this is the, a lot of trees that we have over here, right? So we are going to have, say, if you have, uh, this is 10,000, actually it's a lot. So if you have 10,000 uh, iterations and you have 10 features and then you will have 100K trees. And that is uh, n, n, n more times than the original boosted machine since you keep the trees separate for each feature variable. And then how can we uh, kind of quantify the effect of the F1, which then is this uh, function F1, it will be a sum of all these trees. But this is the form of that. So if you are going to sum the output of all these trees for F1, so this is the effect of F1, and starts the effect of F2, F3, Q, Fn. So, so, so here the x-axis is basically just the value of F1. And then you are going to see how the output is going to change as you increase the value, as you change the value of F1. So you will see that as you F1 is higher, the contribution from F1 is also higher. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I see a question about uh, whether it assumes the features being independent. Yeah, so that's uh, that, 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 that definitely is the limitation of this, right? So it assumes that if, if you do not model the interactive term, if you just use the feature term, and then, then, then yes. All right. um, and, but I don't see that I don't see there is a problem if there are two features that are correlated. Uh, then, then it means that basically the F2 cannot 
cannot, for example, if F1 and F2 are kind of correlated, uh, and then means that F2 can no longer, for example, contribute more than F1 uh, in, in that model, but I don't think it, it will disrupt the model or, or makes the model doesn't work. Yeah, so, so here the assumption is, yes, we, we just treat all the features to be, uh, to be separate uh, from each other. And of course, there can be interactions of the features, but you need to manually add those terms uh, to this model, right? So for example, if we want to add those pairwise interaction like X1 multiplied by X2, and then we need to first fit the mains, mains is which is the individual ones. And then we calculate the residuals from the main ones, but from the main efforts. And then we are going to fit the pairs, it's the pairs of the variables. Uh, and actually here they, they do, is, do it in a heuristically way, a heuristical way, because we, we will have lots of uh, inter pairwise uh, interactions. So they do some match to sort those effective pairs and you, they just select, for example, the top K pairs uh, from that ranking. And then they are going to do the same process again uh, with the individual one. But right now the, the, the top or, or the columns are the, are the pairwise pairs, right? So you have this interaction term of these feature variables. And then for each iteration, you are going to, tr to train a tree by you just using that one interaction term. And uh, here is the kind of the, the contribution effects for the peers. Right? So again, the color indicates how high or low that feature peer values is going to contribute uh, to the predicted outcome. And again, so, so yeah, so you will have all of this uh, interaction effects from this tree. And the effect is basically by summing over all this, uh, all the output from this series of, of trees for that pair. Yeah, so this is their final model. So the final model is the main, so which is you feed the tree separately for each individual feature. And then you learn their individual effect plus the interaction term, of course, you can make it three, three wise uh, interaction as well, right? So here, here the example just to show a pairwise interaction. And then the final prediction will be the sum of these two. Uh, and actually uh, from here, it's very straightforward, right? So, so the model actually explains itself because you know exactly how each feature is going to contribute or how each interaction is going to contribute to your final predicted outcome. Okay, uh, I will pause a little bit here. So any questions so far on the uh, model on this explainable boosted machine? So any questions on how this is trained? Okay, yeah, if not, then let's move on to uh, some of the results that the author claims. And actually they claim the, the explainable boosting machine very effective. Uh, this is, a, uh, they, they compared it with, the, for example, with the XGBoost and with other regression and other additive models. So this is a general additive models. Or, and also they compare it with the full complexity models, which is a random forest and some other XGBoost. Uh, and, and they compare it, I think they compare it across uh, 10 or more, yeah, 10 classification tasks. And it turns out the explainable GBM have sometimes even the best performance uh, and, and on average, they, they have the highest score, the explainable GBM, along with the best uh, I think it's the best, I forgot what is F here, but it's another variant of the EBM based on the ordering of the features they put in the iteration. So actually the EBM has kind of the high score or at least comparable score to XGBoost, 
which is kind of the winning solution in all nearly many uh, Kaggle competitions that actually boost over there. So they claim that the EBM has comparable and sometimes even better performance uh, comparing to the, to the other models. But uh, what is a great advantage or, or, or what is a great uh, vote for EBM is it, it, you can directly extract the explanation from this model. So you don't need to you know, train a, a, a separate model to, to explain it, but you can directly extract the explanation uh, from the EBM model. Okay, uh, I think uh, next, maybe let's look at some examples of, of why, of how they apply the, the EBM uh, to, the, to the data set and why it is important uh, to, to have a explainable uh, uh, model out there, right? So here, uh, this is a lot of features. So they want to uh, detect how many of these factors uh, kind of are important for this uh, pneumonia. Uh, it's kind of a lung, a lung inflation disease. A data set, right? So they want to detect how, how, how many of these features are kind of critical um, uh, factors or, or to di diagnose uh, this disease. So they apply the EBM to that. Uh, and for example, here it shows how age plays a role or, or whether the, the, the risk of getting this disease increase along with the age. Right, so actually, you see, uh, so this is the explanation extracted from that uh, EBM, right, directly. Then this is how the model is making the prediction. Uh, and you, you see that the risk actually increased uh, from around, for example, 65 uh, as such. Right? And what is um, a little bit doubtful is uh, like after you reach, uh, like uh, 90 or, or something that the, 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 the kind of the risk kind of decline, which is, which is not that uh, intuitive, right? So, so I think the, this, this is because the lack of data over there. So you have less data. So you kind of also, you have large variance over here. Uh, and then this kind of the risk kind of, uh, kind of uh, just decrease uh, due to random, random clause. So, so it's maybe not true. Uh, for it to hold on the right hand. Uh, so what doctor, so when, when doctors see this, right? So to see how the model make a decision and they think this is not true over here. And what is uh, cool for this method is actually they can change it, right? They can say, okay, I want to have, you know, keep it at least not decreasing uh, along with the age. So they can, they can change this uh, line towards the end to be a nearly flat or a slightly increasing risk of, of, of the scores as you, as you age, right? So I think this is really cool because it provides a way to, uh, for the people to look into this to figure out whether it makes sense and, uh, and even provide a way for people to even change, it, change that function, change that judgment so that the model output is more reliable to the expert uh, opinion. Uh, and also they, they, they have done some other additional corrections. Uh, for example, uh, they, there will be some, they want to relate this with other, other disease such as whether they have chest pain or heart disease. And uh, what the uh, model learns from the data is actually quite contradictory, right? So you, if you have it, you, you, you have a lower risk, which is not true uh, according to the medical research. So actually they inverted the effect of this, right? So they, they make this, uh, the, 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 the score actually higher. For example, if you have the chest pain, they will invert the score. And the red one is the prediction or the e extraction from the model. And the green one is after the adjustment of the medical uh, experts. Yeah, so this is a one example. And the lesson learned from this is 
uh, with the interpretable model, actually, once you see how the model kind of behaves, right? So how the model is making the judgment, uh, and if we feel that is counter, uh, that this is uh, uh, not uh, up to the latest medical research or, or, or medical uh, doctor's uh, judgment, actually we can change it. So I really like this because it's, it is a combination of data driven and and uh, and the science or expert driven approach, right? Because the data sometimes when you are when you are you lack of data and then the model may be not uh, true or does not hold when when the data is insufficient, uh, say over ninety over here. So the model kind of decay in, in that region. Uh, but once we are able to see the effects and then. And then the model allows a way for us to make a correction, and then it will make the model more reliable. So this is extremely important uh, for the medical diagnosis, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so I feel this is this is really powerful uh, for the medical applications. So a question is where that patients come from. Uh, I'm not sure. So maybe you can you can you can uh, search this data sets. I, I I would bet this data set is a very standard data set, uh, and you you should be able to to find all the history of, of it and how they connect and how many patients uh, they connect this data set. Uh, so the second use case is for the COVID-19, right? So for example, we want to predict how the mortality risk uh, increases along with the age. Uh, and here, this is the output from the EBM model. So you can see the scores kind of slightly increase after maybe 55 and then they um, uh, increase, uh, increase further over there. Uh, so yeah, so you will see uh, from from like by training an EBM, you can directly extract the the age effect on the uh, on, on the COVID uh, mortality risk, uh, and also you can apply a categorical variable such as like female versus male. So like according to the EBM, the male have a higher risk than than the female, a slightly uh, higher risk. On the female, so so I think what, what is more interesting is this this type of method can, kind of can ex extract sometimes very useful insights and maybe even scientific discoveries from the data, right? So it's it's not just giving you one last predicted outcome, but it also gives you all the reasons, and those reasons reasons are very important uh, for the for the science studies. So not only for interpreting the results, but also for uh, scientific uh, discoveries. Yeah, so I think I will pause uh, here. Uh, here, so any questions on these use cases? Yeah, I have a, a quick question uh, for this uh, COVID nineteen. Um, mm -hmm. did is it also expert opinion that, like, for example, we were talking about in the pneumonia? We adjusted uh, based off of expert um, in, insights, inputs, and so is this also adjusted in, in this uh, model of, for COVID nineteen? Uh, what 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 kind of adjustment? Oh, you... at the at the end, like um, around age one hundred, that sort of thing. Uh, no, I, I think this is or just a fully data driven, a fully data driven uh, approach. I don't. I don't think there's any adjustment over here. Okay. So this is just directly uh, from, from, from the data. And actually you see like the, the data points actually is a lot less uh, over, over 78, right? So you have lots of uncertainties uh, around that. Right, okay. Yeah, Thank yeah you. but this is without adjustment, but this is with adjustment, like the red is the regional and green is the correction. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I see another question is about the explainability in deep learning models. Yeah, I think that belongs to explainable ML uh, instead of the interpretable ML. And actually in interpretable ML, people have also been developing interpretable deep learning models. So, <laughs> so that's very cool, right? So you, you, you have a uh, trained deep learning models and, and then it can explain itself. Um, yeah, so maybe you want to look at that area or if you have a very mature deep learning model already applied in bioinformatics, then maybe later on we will, in the second session, we are going to talk about the explainable ML. Then you can add on top of that deep learning model, this additional uh, explanation models to explain that. Okay. Uh, and I, last, uh, I, I want to talk about the interpret uh, ML. So this is a very popular, I think, uh, uh, a framework also uh, for in, in, in the interpretable models and also explainable explanation models. Right? So they in, in this framework, they have the glass box models like this, like the rule list is basically a wrapper around the scope list that I have just talked about. And also the explainable boosting machine. They have this glass box. They also have the explanation model for the black box, like this uh, many different models to explain a black box. And they, they and this library kind of unifies the two world uh, and handles and, and give it a universal explainer. And this explainer is going to say, gives you some global interpretation and local interpretation for each individual predictions, and also to explain the performance and, and how the data looks. Right? So it will give, also gives you a good visualization and all those interactive parts for the end users. Uh, I have just looked at the interpret ML and uh, it, it seems it just released the alpha, alpha release. I think it's still uh, in under active development, but I think if you want to try out the, the scope, uh, scope list or the explainable boosting machine, you can you can try this interpret ML. Uh, it's very straightforward to use. Uh, let me uh, put an example over here. Yeah, so this is their um, everyone so this is their uh, documentations um so you see over here for example this is an example to use this uh explainable ml to predict uh, whether the, the the income and actually this is just a very uh, example to uh and actually i think it makes the income as a as a binary problem anyway so so here is all the features, and uh, this is your target variables, right? And then they are going to input this uh, train train uh, explainable boosting classifier. And I, I believe the the income is, for example, larger than fifty five k or not. So it's for example, it's a binary classification task. Uh, and here is a feature types that you initialize your uh, classifier. And some are continuous features, some are categorical features, and also you add some interaction uh, features there. Uh, and then you 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 train a EBM, uh, and then here I think, yeah. So you can show the summary, for example, the feature importance of that, and also you can see the uh, effects of each individual each individual uh, features, like how it's, how it's using, uh, or how it's using each individual features to make that prediction. And also, so this is a more like a global explanation. Uh, and also you have the local explanation, which is you can explain the local, each individual cases, right? For example, over here, uh, the, so this is one. Yeah, so predicted is zero, actual is zero, 
and it has a large intercept. And then the second, the top one is the occupation, education, et cetera, right? Uh, for that, for that. Income. So you are, you are going to explain each individual uh, income, uh, each individual uh, instance, like why it's giving you that score out of that. Yeah, so each each prediction is going to have a different a different explanation score. Yeah, so this is a glass box uh, model. So I think uh, feel free to look at this and, and, and try this out. Uh, so I see a question about Omni XAI. I'm not aware of that. So could you uh like a brief introduce it if you have looked at it. I'm not sure about that, but I will definitely look at that. Okay. Um next, uh so if you are really interested into the interpretable ML. And you are not satisfied with just this scope list or explainable GB uh, boosted machine. Uh, you can really uh, follow this group. So this uh, Cynthia uh, professor at Duke. So her lab fully focused on interpretable machine learning. Uh, and if you go to, uh, let me put her link over here. So if, if you go to their, their website, so you will see uh, various kinds of, um, like various kinds of application of interpretable machine learning. And they have also make a computer vision deep learning model directly interpretable by providing some proton layers. So if you are really interested into this and to see how her group, uh, is contributing the interpretable uh, or glass box approaches to various fields. Uh, you can follow her group. And also she has lots of great talks. Uh, you can also find on this link, uh, like uh, she has posted many, many, many uh, videos, uh, talks uh, on that as well. So it's, uh, it's very inspiring to, to watch her, her, her talks. Yeah, so I think I just want to end this today's meetup with this with this question. Right? So next time when you take on a task, so maybe the first question you want to ask ask yourself is whether you want to apply a very complicated uh, black box model or you want to uh, to apply an uh, explainable. Uh, model. I say that EBM, I mean, it's still powerful. It can still gives you a very good accuracy in the end. Uh, but, but at the same time, it gives you a very good explanation. It can explain itself. So maybe give it a try. And, 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 it can, and, and especially at the times that you feel the interpretability is uh, critical uh, to your tax, right? So especially, for example, in healthcare industry, uh, for the diagnosis and for other uh, applications the the the, the interpreted interpretability is is very important in those scenarios and then maybe you want to look into this explainable glass box model and try this for your for your prediction task so i hope that after this meetup you 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 you, you have this question in mind uh next time when you take on a task for the for the prediction <laughs>